Hey guys and welcome back to another video again featuring the video card from hell still not working but before we start off I hope everybody is safe I hope everybody is healthy staying inside following guidelines hoping that in the next couple of weeks months things will return back to normal in your respective countries but now for the video card I have socketed most of the chips, I have cleaned everything up, I double, triple checked all of the traces, everything seems to be fine, but the darn thing just doesn't want to work. So what are we going to do with that? Well, I've been thinking long and hard of just throwing this out, giving it up, but I did learn a thing or two along the way that I wanted to share with you guys here. So this will involve some electronics, looking at some logic chips which are on this video card and just trying to get some clues on why it's not working. And if you have succeeded in watching the full video and if you have any feedback or ideas for me to try out, please let me know in the comment section. I have already spent lots of time on this video card and not getting this thing to work would be just absolutely horrible. <laughs> So I very much welcome all ideas, input, suggestions on helping me get this thing up and running and I will try basically everything. So failure is not an option here. This thing has to work, otherwise I will probably never do a repair again. <laughs> now before we move to the Tseng Labs, I just want to focus a little bit on this IBM MDA video card. It has the same CRT controller, the MC6845. It has a pretty similar layout. It also has the 16.257 crystal. It has some logic chips here that do some magic. It has some RAM chips here at the bottom. So overall, a pretty similar layout. Only this one is working and we have documentation. And I'm not just talking about this MC6845 CRT controller because this is basically the same chip as you also have on the Tseng Labs and on the IBM CGA card. So it's not that difficult to find documentation on that. It's a pretty common chip used in a lot of different cards because what we're really interested in is what makes this thing tick, quite literally. And it's this oscillator here combined with the logic chips around it that generates a signal which is ultimately fed into the CRT controller on this pin 21, the CLK or character clock. Now, when you insert a video card into your PC, and you hook up a monitor, one of the things that the video card needs to do is sync up to the monitor using the correct signal. And the CRT chip is responsible for that. So let's take our oscilloscope, take our probe here and hook it up. Now to attach the ground clip, I'll be using a multimeter lead here, which I have taken off of my multimeter. And I'm gonna use this ground clip from the oscilloscope, hook it up like so. And then I can use the tip of my multimeter probe to hook it up to the Molex connector of the computer for the ground connection. And then with this probe, I will attach a jumper wire so that I can poke the individual pins of the CRT connector for now. And this is kind of a quick and dirty way to do some quick measurements. This is what I'm going to be doing here. So with the PC turned on, as you can see, I can hook it up to the clock pin of the CRT controller. And this gives us a reading of 1.806 megahertz. I'll get back to that number in a bit, but let's also look at the horizontal and the vertical sync generated by the CRT chip. And let's start with the vertical sync, which is this pin right here. And that should give us about 50 hertz, which is the expected a vertical sync for this uh, MDA card and monitor. And finally, let's check the horizontal sync, which is the pin next to the vertical sync. And here you can see we have 18.43 kilohertz. So why am I showing you these numbers? Well, that's because these are the exact same numbers that we expect from a working video card. And it's not the numbers that we are seeing on the Tseng Labs video card. Now, that tells us that there is something wrong with the Tseng Labs, but it gives us very little information on how we get to these numbers. And that's what I wanted to show you next. 
Well, first off, we need to get into some electronics here, but luckily the IBM MDA card is a well-documented card and all of the logic diagrams are available online. So I have a printout here. So the logic diagrams contains about 10 sheets of electronic components. So this is double-sided printed. <laughs> But I wanted to zoom in on sheet number three, because here we see the 16 megahertz oscillator and the magic chip that will convert the signal from the oscillator, the 16.257 megahertz. It will divide it by nine and give it a 1.806 megahertz character clock for the CRT controller. And as you can see here, everything starts from the 16.257 megahertz coming from the crystal. That will be divided by nine to get the character clock. And then the CRT controller takes over and from that character clock, it will deduct the horizontal sync, the data row clock and the vertical sync. So let's zoom in into this little diagram in a little bit more detail. And here you can see the 16.257 megahertz oscillator, which is present on the card. And as you can see, it goes through this logic chip here and then the output, which is also the 16.257 megahertz, at some point enters this 74LS174 chip. So let me zoom in in that one. This chip is a D-type flip-flop and flip-flop chips are often used to divide frequencies. So the idea is that you have an incoming clock this one being 16 point somewhat megahertz, and you wanna divide it down, much like the diagram that we just showed you where you need to dial down the frequency from 16.257 to 1.8 megahertz in order to provide a correct clock to the CRT controller. Well, this is the chip that will actually do that. So as you can see here, I recreated part of the schematic on this breadboard here. I don't have the oscillator, but I do have the D-type flip-flop here and the auxiliary circuit. So this is the D-type flip-flop, the 74LS174, and the other two chips are here to the left. So the D-type flip-flop has a couple of inputs and a couple of outputs. So the outputs, which are here are actually connected up to these five LEDs here. The LED here, we're gonna be using for the clock. So you're gonna see the clock visually through this LED and then also the five outputs. Now the key thing to a D-type flip-flop is that with each clock cycle on the rising edge, so each time you see the clock LED going from low to high, you will see that the D-type flip-flop will copy all of its inputs to its outputs. And because of the way that we have hooked up the outputs to the next inputs, we will get an interesting effect. Now, I've hooked up all of the wiring so that, for example, pin two connects up to pin four, pin five connects up to pin six. So these are basically all of the outputs which are fed back into the next input. And we'll see what the effect of that uh, wiring will be on all of the outputs. So this is the jumper wire here. And then the two final outputs are fed into the other chips here, which I will talk about in a bit. Now the circuit itself at the moment is not doing anything and that's because we haven't attached a clock to this D-type flip-flop. So let's go ahead and do that. And let's take a look at the LEDs on the right, what happens. But first let's pause for a minute and think about what will happen. So you see one output LED which is turned on and that is one Q. Now one Q is hooked up to 2D. So that means that by the next clock cycle, 2D, which is now also high, will copy over its value to 2Q, meaning that the second LED will turn on. So let's take a look. So we start the clock, and as you can see, one by one, the LEDs start turning on. And that's the result of this daisy chaining of outputs and inputs. Basically, the D-type flip-flop will constantly copy a value from the input to the output, because the output is also connected to the input directly, giving us this kind of rolling effect that we see here. 
Now another thing you notice is that by the time the fifth LED turns on, the first LED is turned off. Now again, due to the daisy chaining of the inputs and the outputs, when your first LED is going to be off, every clock cycle will in turn make sure that the next LED also switches off. So again, you get this rolling effect. And it's the two chips on the left that actually determine whether the first input is on or off. And the real side effect that we were looking for is the fact that if you look at the frequency with which these output LEDs turn on and off, you will see that it's actually nine times slower than the clock LED. It becomes clearer if you remove all of the LEDs except for one so that you can clearly see the difference between the clock and the output. And it also helps if you speed up the clock a little bit. And that's one of the good things about using an Arduino because it's very easy to change the duty cycle of the incoming clock here. So let's make it go a little bit faster. Flash it to the Arduino. And you'll see that for every nine times that the clock uh, blinks, the output LED will either turn on or off. And it's exactly that frequency division by nine that we wanted to achieve here. And if you really want to know in depth how this particular circuit works, I've asked a question here on electrical engineering and I got a great response on how this uh, frequency division is uh, taking place on this particular circuit. And the person who answered the question added a truth table here so you can actually see how the outputs are behaving and what exactly is causing that um, you know, cycle to change when first the LEDs are turning on and then they're turning off again. So I highly recommend you taking a look at that. I'll post a link uh, in the description to this question and answer. I think it's very useful to get an idea on how it works. Now for this video I was thinking about adding some additional footage on how this D-type flip-flop works on a very basic level but I ended up not doing that because I think there are other people who are much better at doing that and have a much more uh, focused channel for that type of stuff. So I highly recommend the following channel from Mr. Ben Eater. He has a bunch of cool videos on electronics, logic gates. He even built his own uh, computer on a breadboard. I highly recommend his channel. And also if you look for information like, for example, this D-type flip-flop, he goes really in-depth in, in teaching you the, the basics of all of these components. I want to thank him for teaching me the art of breadboard electronics. It's an excellent mix of theory and uh, practice. It goes really in-depth without overwhelming you and he explains everything really, really well. Highly, highly recommended and lots of stuff on his channel. So definitely check it out. Now I've showed you in the beginning of the video how I use the jumper wire to do some basic measurements using the oscilloscope, but that becomes really tricky if you want to measure two signals at the same time, because here I want to show you the uh, oscillator uh, signal as well as the divided uh, signal by the D-type flip-flop. So I'm going to be hooking up two probes at the same time, and for that you really need to solder wires onto the PCB. And here you can see the two frequencies that I was talking about. So you see the initial 16 megahertz frequency coming from the oscillator, which is in yellow. And then the blue uh, line here represents the division by nine, which is the 1.807 megahertz, which feeds into the uh, CRT controller. So as you can see here, the transition from high to low uh, between the yellow and the blue is a division of nine. But back to the Tang Labs, because there I didn't see those numbers at all. So I was focusing on the clock circuit here on this Tang Labs to see what's going on. Now the first chip I wanted to look at was this uh, set of hex inverters here, which is the SN74ALS04 chip. Now the reason why I'm looking at this chip is because the clock circuit that I have on the Tang Lab didn't output a clock at all. And as you can see on this breadboard, it is indeed the case. Where I should see 18.4 megahertz, I'm not seeing anything at all. But if I replace this chip with a good chip, you can see that I have a valid clock signal right now. So in this chip, we have six 
inverters. So let me draw them here inside the chip. So every inverter has an input and an output. And the idea is pretty simple. So each of these inverter inputs takes either a logic high or low. And if it's a logic high, it turns it into low. And if it's a logic low, it turns it into high. So it basically inverts the input. Now I happen to have a little circuit here just to demonstrate this. This is a brand new chip. So I'm giving it five volts and I'm hooking it up to ground. And using my multimeter, I am going to be monitoring this output here. Now let's see what happens when I give it an input. I give it an input low and on the output I see high, which is good. I give it an input high and on the output I get a low, which is good. Now let's do the same with the faulty chip. As you can see, input low, no output. Input high, no output. So this chip is definitely bad. So after identifying the faulty chip and replacing it with a brand new one, I decided to put the video card on my bench power supply. And I'm using these leads here that go into these uh, headers on the video card. It's not an ideal solution because there is going to be a voltage drop because of these types of connections. So as you can see, my power supply is outputting 5.09 volts. But on the video cards, I am only getting 4.1 volts, and that's due to the voltage drop across these connectors. As you can see, the power consumption is actually larger than I expected. It's 1.8 amps uh, almost. So with those kinds of amps, you will see a voltage drops across these kind of connections. But I wanted to check the clock signal on that uh, CRT controller just to see if I was also able to get that 1.8 megahertz, and that seems to be the case on the bench power supply that is because as soon as I uh, add the card into a PC I no longer get the 1.8 megahertz but I only get one megahertz which is odd. I also check the temperature of the components on the video card and everything is relatively normal I think except there are two components that easily go to 60 degrees Celsius and I'm not really sure if that is normal because they are getting you know too hot to touch but other than that all of the other chips seems to be fine I am a little bit worried about the power consumption not really sure if that's normal but what worries me even more is that when I put the video card into a PC and I hook up my oscilloscope probes here in order to check the character clock. I'm not seeing the 1.8 megahertz that I'm used to seeing on the IBM MDA card and even on this card on the test bench, but I'm getting a different value. Instead of the 1.8 megahertz that I'm expecting, I, I'm only seeing 1.01 megahertz. And that also means that the vertical sync and the horizontal sync will be off, so it will not be able to display anything on a monitor. Now why it does that is something that I don't really understand at this point, and that's why I need your help. Why is it that I'm able to see a perfect 1.806 MHz on the character clock on my test bench, but I fail to see that when the video card is in a PC? I think this is part of the key in order to get this video card working again. So that's it for now. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to show you a working video card just yet. I do have hopes that I will be able to fix it sometime in the future, but like I said, if any of you guys have any input to share or are willing to help me out, that would be great. I had a couple of people already reach out to me and giving me lots of help and pointers, but I still haven't been able to fix it. And I am planning on fixing it, but I think next video will be a more normal video featuring computers and such. So um, you will be seeing this video card in future videos and hopefully it will be working by then. So. In the meantime, uh, stay safe, everybody. Uh, stay inside if you can. Uh, I hope to see you guys for a next video soon. If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. Provide any feedback in the comment section. Consider subscribing to the channel. And I hope to see you guys soon. Bye-bye.